From the Alex Trebek stage at Sony Picture Studios, this is Inside Jeopardy! Hello and welcome back to Inside Jeopardy, your exclusive and official podcast destination for all things happening in the world of Jeopardy. I'm Sarah Foss and I'm joined today by Buzzy Cohen. Hey Sarah, thank you for having me. I also want to send a very, very, very special happy birthday to my wife, who, sort of like Leonardo DiCaprio's girlfriends, is still 25 and looking amazing. Happy Um, birthday, Alicia. (laughs) And happy Juneteenth. Yeah. And happy belated Father's Day to you, Thank you. And I'm going to wish a happy Father's Day to all the dads out there. Your husband, Chris. Uh, I'm going to wish a happy Father's Day to my dad, Maurice Cohen, who I know listens to the podcast every week. What is a typical uh, buzzy family Father's Day? I, you know, as you know, I'm not big into celebrating myself, and I prefer to take my birthdays or Father's Days as kind of just like take it easy days. So the big thing for me is like not having to do that much. (laughs) Um, I often take a... um, how can I put this? I often take an unplanned nap on Sunday afternoon, Ooh, which raises that's like the a I- perfect Father's well, Day. Well, I mean, it <laughs> happens every Sunday, but it often raises <laughs> the ire of my family because they want to do stuff, and there I am. I've just kind of passed out. I'm really getting old. <laughs> but um, so I was, you know, part of Father's Day is I'm going to take that nap, and nobody's going to give me a hard time about it. So. I like it. But they usually they're very very sweet about my Sunday naps. But the Father's Day nap, I made it a little more special. Well, last week, I can't even believe I am saying this. I now have a 10 year old. Oh, my, my, my God. My older daughter turned 10. I've got a double digit kid. Happy birthday. Gemini. Interesting. How does that make you feel? Uh, it makes me feel <laughs> fine. But what made me feel even better is celebrating it at our favorite place Disneyland. Oh, yes. oh my God. Tiki. Tiki. You know, it's not as hot as it normally is in right. June here in LA. Normally yeah. by June, you're bacon. I'm looking for a little escape to the Tiki, 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 Tiki oh, lounge. Yeah. But kind of chilly yeah you know it didn't have the same effect but and it's still fun you know normally this would be like prime splash mountain season to cool you oh, off and you, it kind of works out that it's closed yeah we still had lots of fun so don't don't cry for us but uh thought of you while i was at disneyland well last week we had ken on the podcast to talk about his new book 100 places to see after you die and i just want to remind everyone that on this is jeopardy the other podcast that you are all subscribed to we've been taking a look back at ken's historic run and even had the chance to speak with some of the 148 contestants that had competed against him and just last week we unpacked the ibm challenge between ken brad rudder and a little computer known as Watson. It was super interesting hearing from Ken and Brad about receiving that call and their individual prep work to compete against the computer along with Watson's prep work to compete (laughs) against Ken and Brad. Well, the episode you referenced first from a couple of weeks ago, the the Ken Roadkill episode. (laughs) Yes. I just, when I saw that title, I went, oh, it kind of hurts. But I loved it because... Those are the untold stories we never hear from the people. You hear from Nancy Zerg, right. obviously, who defeated Ken. But all those other people who showed up on that tape day not knowing yeah. the juggernaut that stood before them or beside them up there on that stage. I loved it. I really found it interesting. And, you know, I always thought if you're going to lose, you want to say, I lost to Ken Jennings. Totally. Like, you have to say no more. There's no more explanation totally. needed. People would just be like... Oh, you are brilliant, but right. you lost to the goat. Yeah, exactly. Like it, it seems like one of the better ways to lose um, if you have to. And the Watson episode of the podcast, you know, that was just such a unique time. We all have our thoughts on yeah. uh, Watson. and um, Especially now that AI is so ubiquitous. Watson was like kind of the first time I think all any of us as normal people really had AI that in a our homes, could you know, think like in that same way and process. Yeah, and, yeah, I mean, there had been like Deep Blue, the we talk about mm-hmm. Deep Blue, the chess, but uh, again, that seemed so like you know, computers had been playing chess. The idea of a computer doing something like Jeopardy, which feels so much more human, yeah, really was like a a touch touchstone moment. I think it was a really interesting time to be a part of the show. I remember seeing all the rehearsals. And, you know, just the first time you heard Watson speak, you know, and, and answering yeah. in the form of a question. And so, again, all the things I'm enjoying, not just being on this podcast with you, Buzzy, <laughs> but listening to This is Jeopardy. There's so much insight 
Um, for those of you who haven't listened, make sure you check them out. The good thing about them is they're evergreen. You can yeah. got a long summer road trip coming up. Yeah. Just start that This Is Jeopardy stream going, and you're going to be entertained for hours. Thank you. Well, I um, <laughs> appreciate that. I mean, I'm really trying to make the This Is Jeopardy live up to the show that we are diving into. So I'm so glad to hear. You know, the challenge of the Clue Crew used to be to bring clues to life. And Buzzy, you bring the podcast to life. Oh, stop it. You are too kind. You are Ah, too, too kind to me. Not really. You know me. (laughs) All right. How about we dive into the highlights of last week's games? Cue the beep boops. We kicked off the week with returning champion Suresh Krishnan going for his fifth all-important TOC qualifying win against Michael Vallely and Marilyn Singer. Suresh and Michael were neck and neck up until Michael found the second daily double in the double jeopardy round. He wagered big $8,400 and was correct. He takes a big but not insurmountable lead heading into final from second place. Okay, this is the Suresh we know and love. (laughs) Suresh is coming from behind with the only correct response capping off an exciting win well uh, my hat is off to you michael for making that gutsy daily double i'm always going to support someone doing that and look almost a runaway not quite and suresh what a i mean talk about gutsy wagers almost all of his money on final jeopardy congratulations i'd be curious you know of our toc qualifiers through the years how many five-time champions (laughs) have have had come from behind wins in four of their five victories I mean, Carlos is going to start crunching the numbers the second we <laughs> the get stats, out of here. The also, stats we will come. we talked about Father's Day. Uh, we did have that fun uh, pop songs, love it, dad themed music, uh, and the thousand dollar clue. It's what Papa's got in the title of a 1965 <laughs> James Brown hit. What is a brand new bag? Digga, 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 bow. Woo! Another fun category: Ben and Jerry's flavor graveyard. Yes, all those flavors you may have loved them, but they died. Wavy gravy, Ethan almond, cannoli, peach, macadamia. I never had peach or cannoli or macadamia, but I certainly. <laughs> now you know why they died. But I know wavy gravy. Oh, I yeah, mean, wavy gravy who was a big one. would have ever thought that would have died? Yeah. I don't know. Uh, we also learned Suresh does not know how to tie a tie. Oh. Yeah. Just kind of well, has a bunch of them that he can just like tighten, you know? Interesting. Mm-hmm. Interesting approach. This well, is something that was never spoken by Buzzy. How <laughs> young were you when you first learned to tie a tie? It has to be many moons ago. A young I think Buzz I must Buzz. have been like four or five. I love that. I love that. Yeah, I think I was wearing non-clip-ons by, by kindergarten. Well, Suresh, maybe that's why he didn't wear any ties on, yeah, didn't, I on think, the show by the so way, far. I do want to give him credit because I remember being in the green room. People had ties. They didn't know how to tie them. The contestant team was trying <laughs> to help. If you don't know how to tie, the day that you're on Jeopardy is not the day to don't learn. Don't bring a tie. Don't bring a tie. <laughs> well, a tieless Suresh returned on Tuesday to face off against Joe Seibert and Laura Blyler Scanlon. Suresh maintained a small but steady lead through the Jeopardy and Double Jeopardy rounds despite finding none of the daily doubles. And in Final Jeopardy... He came up with the correct response, securing a sixth win. What a like what a conventional win for Suresh. I know. Leading going into final and not then a runaway. Get, not a runaway and gets final correct. I'm sort of I don't want to say I'm disappointed in Suresh, but like I'm here for the drama. I live for the Suresh <laughs> drama and it's like, wow, what a what a you know, Jeopardy game he just played. <laughs> Well, we kept the uh, Father's Day fun going. We had a category, Dadjectives, mm-hmm. a little example, $600 clue, a 2015 headline, this kind of dad who died to get out of paying child support pays $10,000, sentenced to jail. That's a deadbeat dad. A uh, form of a question, Buzzy? What is a deadbeat dad? There we go. Another fun clue in this show, after we've been talking about Ken's book, it was in the category of deep books. Ken Jennings' 100 Places to See After You Die includes this Hall of the Slain that has the Valkyries as barmaids. What is Valhalla? Yes. I will um, say, uh, since I've gotten to dig in a little bit to Ken's book, I did enjoy, as a big Star Trek fan, he talks about <laughs> Stovacor and like the other places that the Klingons go, which are you know sort of based on Valhalla is the idea. Super I'm Jeopardy also, nerd stuff right yep, there, and Buzzy I'm, is here for it. And I'm also disappointed that our uh, it feels like something that 
our producers like you uh, and our writers like Michelle and Billy would make Ken present a clue about his own book. Just, I mean, I know you never would in reality, but it would also be really funny yes. to make him do that. But we didn't, and we actually only wanted to do it if it right. was Mayim right. reading the clue about Ken's book. And of course, she then said, make sure to check it out because it was coming out on June 13th. It is out and Suresh, at the end of the game, he just says, you know, he's feeling on top of the world. He's super mellow. He's having fun. That, as he nears $100,000. Wow. Wow. Well, moving on to Wednesday, Suresh is facing Holly Hassel and Nile Amen. Suresh got off to a slow start while Holly took an early lead that she maintained through most of the game until Nile caught his stride late in double jeopardy. Took a small lead into final, but when all three players responded incorrectly, it was Holly with that small wager from second place who upsets Suresh, our six-game winner. Congratulations, Suresh. I did enjoy that with a $0 bet. Suresh took the opportunity to do a who is mom and who is love mom and dad. Um, you know, I love a little message in a final. It's sweet. And also, I get where Suresh is coming from. We've got... Uh, Nile and Holly very close they're probably both gonna he's thinking they're both gonna wager big very savvy of Holly to wager small from that position yeah Uh, you think that Nile is gonna bet to cover and so what you want to do is bet so that you don't give Suresh a chance to double up and take it from you Uh, hats off to Holly for that one I apparently also need to give an apology I need to issue an apology to Suresh He wants to use all of his Jeopardy earnings to travel, and he blames the Clue Crew (gasps) for his obsession with travel after (laughs) seeing Jimmy and I travel to so many beautiful and interesting places. So now he joked that, you know, Jeopardy is paying for his obsession. I apologize, Suresh, but it's a great way to spend your money. So Well, Jeopardy also paid for your obsession with travel, so you you and Suresh are not so different after all. in a slightly different way, but yes. I will ask, so if Suresh says, all right, Clue Crew, I mean, we've talked about your favorite places to go, but if it's like, okay, Jimmy and Sarah, I've got this money now. I've got one shot. Where do I go? Is he going to Jimmy's favorite place we've ever gone, Rome? Rome? Or is he going to my favorite place, Antarctica? I know but who sh- I know who should win. Those are your favorite places, but is that where you would recommend someone to go? Yes, absolutely. Okay. okay. Right. Absolutely. Right. Hands down. I think you should take the family, Buzzy. I want to take my family one day. It's the place to go. All right. Now, you may or may not know that we always talk to a champion Mm -hmm. at the end of a week if they have won at least four games. So we actually caught up with Suresh two weeks ago after he had won his fourth game. Now that we know we're saying goodbye to Suresh, I want to take a listen to that interview right after he claimed that fourth win. Suresh Krishnan, you are now a four-day Jeopardy champion. How does that sound to you? (laughs) It's a bit unreal still. And uh, so my first three games, I... It's all been come from behind, uh, so I kind of been trailing going into the final jeopardy. So it's been really surreal. The last one was a lock, so I was like super happy. Like you know, I could really rest and not worry about final jeopardy. But it's been like fantastic experience. Like you know, uh, like you know, meeting with the host, like the production crew is like amazing, and they're like everybody's like so kind and nice. It's just been fantastic. So they kind of get me, made me get over the nerves. So it's just phenomenal experience. Like. I think everybody should get to do this. So, but I know you cannot get everybody on, but it's awesome. Tell me about your Jeopardy journey. Have you been trying to be a contestant for a while? No, it's like more like a living room contestant. So I would like be shouting out the answers. And when I heard like, you know, uh, Alex got like, you know, cancer, uh, that's when I decided to start a trial. That's like, I need to be on, right? Like when Alex is on. So I started trying out like three years ago, like slightly more now. Uh, and like finally, like this year, I kind of went through, like in 2022, I went through all the you know, the second test and the auditions and so on. So I kind of like didn't hear anything. I was like, okay, like probably it's gonna come, probably it's not. So I was like kind of like keeping the expectations down at home with my family. But like then I got the call and I had to go to Japan. So I've been away like for the last two weeks. I just came back from Japan. Uh, this is for a work trip. So like it's not for like one of those mileage trips. So I just came back on Saturday to LA. So I changed my tickets to get back so I could be on this. Well, clearly the jet lag is is not lasting for you. It's my day for me. No, no, I'm just kidding. I have no idea what time zone I'm in. It's like a lot of caffeine and coke and so on. So (laughs) pretty good. What were your expectations for yourself coming into this? What did you think? You said you've been playing from the living room. Did you think, I could be a four-day champion. I might make it to the TOC. I I did not. Like, so I was thinking like uh, my goal is to win a day. So like I could be a Jeopardy champion and I kind of hold it against my 
wife and kids and so on, because I want my kids to go on Jeopardy too at some point. So I just said, okay, like I need to have some bragging rights to go on. So I was thinking if I win a day, I'm going to be happy. So I'm really, really surprised and super happy to be a four-day champ. Well, I have to I have to point out that in last year's Tournament of Champions, all of our four-day winners did make it to the tournament. So there's a good chance we could see you in the Tournament of Champions. How does that sound? That sounds like surreal. Like, you know, it's almost too hard to believe. So I, I would be like super happy to get in, but like really I'm already super happy. Like I'm on top of the world. Like if I could sing an Imagine Dragon song, like I probably would, but I don't want to. I know, well, because like, you know, there's going to be licensing issues. Exactly. Otherwise, we would love to hear you sing. Yeah. You've earned over $50,000 so far. Any plans for those winnings? Mm, kids college fund, I would guess. Like it's like where it's going to go towards and yeah. Like uh, maybe some trips around the world if I can uh, with the whole family. Um, maybe South America somewhere. Um, not sure. Iguazu Falls is something on my list, so I probably have to go there. I like it. Well, that was on Alex Trebek's list as well. He didn't see it, so I hope you can. Congratulations on a great run so far, and we'll see you next week. Thanks a lot. Thanks, Sarah. All right, let's take a look at Suresh's stats. Six wins. He's now tied with, whew, none other than Troy Meyer. Wow. A big Jeopardy great this season. Yep. He's only the seventh player to reach that status level this season. Chris Panulo, Ray Lalonde, Troy Meyer, as we just mentioned, Stephen Webb, Hannah Wilson, and Ben Chan. So he's in very good company. Mm. 111 correct responses over his run. 85% correct rate on that. Only one runaway. Yep, we yep. talked about it. As we talked about, he had to work hard for his wins. But he really was good in Final Jeopardy. Five yep. out of seven correct. Total earnings, $96,595. Enjoy your travel, and we will see you back here for the TOC. Hi, I'm Buzzy Cohen. You've heard me on Inside Jeopardy, breaking down stats, analyzing contestant plays, and reviewing key moments from recent games. Well, I'm hosting another Jeopardy podcast, but this one's a little bit different. Think less sports, more history. We'll be taking you on a journey from Jeopardy's beginning in the 1960s through the Alex Trebek years to its current day super champs. For the last 60 years, we've been watching one show. Hear how it all came together on This Is Jeopardy, the story of America's favorite quiz show. Out now from Sony Music Entertainment and Sony Pictures TV. Holly returned on Thursday to face Suzanne Goldlust and Kieran McCormick. Now, Suzanne came out of the gate running for an early lead, never looking back. After finding and responding correctly to both Daily Doubles and Double Jeopardy, she cruised her way to a runaway win. Well, in spite of not betting big on any of these Daily Doubles, Suzanne made it work for her. Just think about how much more money you would have, Suzanne, though, if you had bet thousands and thousands of dollars. But 21 correct responses over the course of the game and, you know, a 91% correct rate. Very, very strong. And um, we would say maybe a traditional hat trick because she had a traditional all hat three trick. Daily Doubles. She had a win and she had it in a runaway fashion. A Sarah Foss hat trick. Maybe what we can attribute her being so good at Jeopardy is that she is a New York Times crossword puzzle solver every day. Current streak, 907 days completed in a wow. row, Buzzy. That is for real. Whew, that that's is dedication. For, like, what do you do when you like are on a long plane ride? And I don't know. Yeah, it's dedication. That's, it. that's all it is, period. Well, it's working for Suzanne. Um, I do want to add to our stat roundup. Maybe Ooh. maybe next season okay. um, we'll talk. Uh, I'll talk to um, our podcast producers, Alexa and Carlos. I want to know when we come back on a Thursday game after lunch, I want to know what our three players had for lunch. Mm. Because I think we got to start digging into that okay. analysis. You the know lunch I mean? roundup. It's like, you know, the, the old time bookies who would find out that like the college quarterback's girlfriend dumped him and then they would, you know, so they could. I want to know what the lunch roundup is well it's funny because i always was very curious about that whenever we would have a yeah. big champion yeah and james holtzauer comes to mind because he would have two pieces of pizza yeah and a soda yeah and i just thought wow that is your brain food like it's, that's working for you yeah. i would have that and i'd be laying horizontal yeah. across the podium spread. i do want to shout out my inspiration for this uh is uh a little bit of andy saunders who runs the jeopardy fan and used to do a jeopardy live panel which was a pr sort of a predecessor of this podcast in a way where if there was a champ you would have people on who were on the show the previous week and have a discussion with them um, and he would always ask what they had for lunch so 
Well, and one thing, you know, we're coming up on our first season of this podcast. Hard to believe that we've been doing it almost a full year. And we want to know what people like. What do you want to see more of? What do you want to see less of? Is there a segment you just think, in addition to what did they have for lunch, you know, what do we want to feature? So please, you know where to send us your comments inside Jeopardy Podcast at gmail.com. Now's the time because we're going to start looking in the off season at how we're going to restructure it for season 40, for our season two of Inside Jeopardy. And we want this to be the place that you get all things Jeopardy. So whatever that looks like to you, please let us know. And if the answer is less buzzy, I can take it. I'm a big boy. <laughs> that could never Let's be. move on to Friday. We are closing out the week with Suzanne going for her second win up against Ben Goldstein and Erica Rayfield. It was a tight Jeopardy round with less than $2,000 separating all three of our players. Ben kicked it up in the double Jeopardy round, though, with an early big daily double. Erica finished strong, though, to take a small lead in final. Again, triple stumper here. All three players incorrect. Second place, Ben Goldstein was able to get that all-important come from behind win, and he does a huge uppercut celebration <laughs> when he's announced as the winner. I love a good celebration. Yeah, I think we need the social team to do like an old like 80s sitcom like freeze frame on yeah, that for the because it's it's freeze frame worthy. Yes, I I don't know why, but I was on set for this game, just this game. I don't know what was going on, but maybe we were recording afterwards we or were. something. At the end of the day, we were doing a rare Inside Jeopardy Indo Day taping. Yeah, and I but what's funny about that is I had to run to the post office afterwards. And I'm dropping off some mail at the Culver City Post Office right down the street. And who walks by? Ben Goldstein. No. And his uh, his invited guests. And he was riding high. And I said, congratulations. Because you knew. Because I knew because I had just been there. Yeah. I mean, I was the only person in the world that he could actually have kind of celebrated that with. Um, So congratulations, Ben. And Ben Goldstein will be Karina Nushu's last champion, Mm. actually, at Jeopardy. I know we've talked about this on the pod, but this was officially Karina's last tape day. Karina was with Jeopardy for 17 seasons. I've obviously worked with her. We've traveled the country finding great Jeopardy contestants. She's one of the best. She's loved by our contestants. It's hard to imagine Jeopardy without her as a part of the show, but she's moving on and we wish her all the best. And I'm going to keep with me a lot of, a lot of Karina fun memories. I mean, When you look for contestants all over this country, the contestant searches only last a certain amount of hours, but there's a lot of time in the day for meals and touring and just fun. You know, that's part of what has made this job so great over the years is that you spend more time with some of these people than you do often with your own (laughs) families. So when you lose someone from the team or when someone moves on, it is a real loss because they are more than just a coworker. And Karina was certainly more than that. Yeah. And Karina was there at my audition and through my wow. whole time on the show. So it's really, you know, it's ha- I'm happy, hoping she has a lovely time and whatever comes next. But it's, you know, sad to not have her there when I when I come visit set anymore. And now what do you say we move on to some viewer questions? Let's do it. <laughs> Brenda asks, I was a season 36 contestant and I've been listening to both the Inside Jeopardy and This Is Jeopardy podcasts. Bless you, Brenda, for that. Love you, Brenda. Uh, While I understand how you can practice for speed on a buzzer at home, I really don't think it helps very much because it's more the timing that is critical rather than speed, which can end up by you locking yourself out. Frankly, is by feeling the rhythm of the enabler that you can find buzzer success, yet there is no way to figure that out before being on stage at home. You can't see the unlock light, so how is buzzing in fast at home of any benefit when you can't know Michael Harris's reaction time and cadence? Well, I think this is something you can speak to more, but my initial comment is that reaction time is reaction time. It's great practice. Whatever you make your target, then you're still practicing your reaction time obviously in the studio you'll have a different target but that training is still going to be beneficial exactly um so i think when people talk about buzzer speed i actually like to talk about buzzer accuracy more than buzzer speed um i took a lot of uh training things from the nfl where similarly if you do too early you're penalized too late you're too late so they have a lot of great drills for training that kind of reaction time but not being too early another thing that i did was that i worked with an online buzzer app that actually Fritz Holtznagel, who we interviewed in the Mm -hmm. buzzer episode, developed. And one thing that you can do with Fritz's app is set a delay for the enabling of the buzzer. So you can say, I want to be 
only able to buzz in a half quarter of a second after the clue is finished reading so i would start playing with different um delays and my goal was to get back into my average speed as quickly as possible so for me it wasn't necessarily always about getting faster but about being to, able to adjust my speed faster or slower quickly and that is what makes a really great Jeopardy player. You see a lot of the greats use the Jeopardy, like we talked about Matea and Masters. Mm -hmm. Jeopardy round, horrible buzzer round, double Jeopardy went on fire. And that is what they are doing. Matea is adjusting the speed, um, trying to figure out where that sweet spot is. So I think that is something that you can really work on at home. Yeah, I totally agree. It's it's knowing, okay, whatever I'm doing isn't working. I need to adjust in that moment, being able to do that without getting too in your head, not overthinking it, just, okay, right. I've done the training. I must right. be I must be ringing in a bit too fast. i got to slow it down. And, you know, the contestant team is there to help you with that as exactly. well on the breaks because they have our Elvis system. They know exactly who's ringing in, who's ringing in too fast, who's ringing in too slow, and that's why, you know, they have that system right in front yep. of their desk so that they can go and give that much-needed help in those commercial breaks. And to hopeful contestants out there you know now that you know that they have that you can ask them at the first commercial break before the interview hey how am i am i am i generally into slow or into fast and that can help you get that feedback i don't know sometimes they'll give that to contestants um if they're see really seeing a pattern but you can also ask and maybe they'll tell you i don't know if they want to get into someone's head but yeah you know if most you're... of that they do try to address in the rehearsal game exactly that's that time where yeah. they will they'll stop not even in the middle of a round they'll stop yeah. after a couple of clues again they want that rehearsal to be as beneficial as possible yeah. for every person to rehearse so they're stopping at any moment when they see any trend totally and they're giving that advice totally so yeah i would say you know work on your accuracy work on how quickly you can get back into the groove changing um that timing if you can find a system like that thank there you for is the a question. benefit there is a benefit brenda thank you for the question brenda uh, Ian asks, during the opening camera pan of the audience, there's an area just behind the far left judge where a couple people are sitting at a blue <laughs> topped table. Who well, sits there? Well, first off, that blue topped table is, in fact, our Inside Jeopardy podcast desk. So anytime <laughs> we record live from the Alex Trebek stage, the desk is actually pivoted so that the Jeopardy that you normally see on that angle is facing the audience area as opposed to it facing the stage. So you There's, get that beautiful stage as a backdrop. You get the beautiful stage as a backdrop. Exactly. And, you know, through most of COVID, we weren't showing the audience at all. And that's when that desk was actually first installed and first created. And so then what would happen is behind the desk, you know, some people would sit at the desk and those people that were sitting at the desk during COVID, actually the enabler, Michael yeah. Harris, was yeah. seated at the Inside Jeopardy desk as well as Matthew Godfrey um, from Standards and Practices from the Sullivan Compliance Company because there wasn't enough room for them at the judges' table because we had the big glass partitions and we all had to be six feet apart. So it was only recently that they got to join the table again. <laughs> we got to open up the audience. We got to show the audience area. And so there was a lot of discussion like, well, what do we do with the desk? Should we, should we, should we move it out? If we're not using it during the tapings of the shows, should we have it empty? Well, it looks kind of odd to have it empty. So, of course, I nominated our podcast producers, Carlos and Alexa, to sit there. But truth be told, Carlos works a lot on the stats during those tapings. Mm -hmm. And it's not really as efficient for him to be on the stage. He can actually do the stats a lot more efficiently from his office with a live feed of the show and the rest of the stats team. So Alexa is often there from our team. And then usually we have a representative from our social and digital team who is sitting there. Uh, Mayim's sons came to a taping recently. And I said, hey, do you guys want to sit at the Inside Jeopardy desk? <laughs> We've talked about making it a, a giveaway that you could win, oh. you know, VIP tickets that Ooh. you could win seats at the Inside Jeopardy desk. So more to come. Well, and I'm hoping that as, as you guys do more, you know, primetime Jeopardy events, Hopefully, Inside Jeopardy can really be in the moment at that desk, bringing people up to the minute. Yes, know, and that is definitely Michael's vision. That's why the desk <laughs> was built. You know, Michael still wants to take this show live. And if we do, that desk would certainly be needed for those moments when, hey, we've got a stop down. We've got a ruling to discuss. You know, and we've got to analyze it live 
from the Inside Jeopardy desk. And you burn a couple of those minutes. Burn a couple of those ABC yes. primetime minutes. No one can do it better than us. <laughs> <laughs> All right, that is it. We've burned a couple of your minutes this morning, but hopefully you've enjoyed it. That is it for today's show. Listeners, thank you for joining us. And as always, subscribe to the podcast, rate us, leave us a comment, share across social, and follow us at Jeopardy on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, on YouTube, and on TikTok. And send us your questions or your suggestions. We want to keep this podcast the best possible version for all of you to Inside Jeopardy Podcast at gmail.com. We'll see y'all next week. Ken, what's that thing the kids say? You mean smash the like, subscribe, and bell button so you'll be the first to know when we upload more great videos? Yeah, that's it. Do that.